Uh, hello. Hello. Now, I'm, I'm in a funny position because glasses on or glasses off, because I need glasses to read this, but I can't see you. I don't, I've got a very mild prescription, so you all look a bit blurred otherwise. Hey, how's everyone doing? I put, I put trousers on, OK, which is... <laughs> Not I was in my underpants, but as in I put like I took my shorts because it's boiling, right? So um, I've got my shorts handy for changing into immediately afterwards. But um, no, it's good to be here, and thanks for inviting me. And um, it's the first time I've been to this conference. I drove up from Brighton this morning and left my wife Denise with our five-year-old and our two-year-old in boiling temperatures, which is kind of like seems a bit unfair, really. But there we go. She's resilient. And she, she sprung into action and ordered a paddling pool for Amazon. So and they're very cute. I should, I, do you know what? If I'd have thought about it, I'd, I'd, get, I'd have got pictures because they are uber cute. Um, and um, usually. Uh, those of you, no, they are. Those of you who've got children know what I mean, though. Um, but um, I, I think, how, how many of you know, I, I don't, because I, I was going to do a little bit about my background just because I think it's quite helpful before going into the Sabbath. Is that okay? Uh, yeah, because you don't know me, I don't know you. I thought, let's get to know each other a little bit. Is that all right? Um, so I, am, um, I grew up in a Jewish family in North London, Camden. Funnily enough, when J. John was speaking this morning, it was quite funny because, well, I suppose this isn't a funny thing, but, but the house in where Amy Winehouse died is in the square where I grew up, Camden Square. So... Um, yeah, it was just funny when he was saying that, and I was thinking, it's a funny little, you know, isn't the world a, a, a small place? And, and um, my very typical Jewish family, very scholarly, doctors, lawyers. My dad was professor of hematology and, you know, all, all very, very high-powered. And um, my brother's a, a lawyer and my sister's a doctor, so in the kind of Jewish holy triumvirate, I should have been an accountant, really. <laughs> And then they would have had everything they need for their old age. But unfortunately, I was the rebellious son. I'm, a ter I'm really, my wife will tell you, I'm not a rule follower. And um, so I was very rebellious. And not only did I not go to university, but um, after a series of... Now, I, I was looking for the truth. I remember having my bar mitzvah, age 13, and about this tall. Uh, so, so small that I couldn't actually see over the bimmer very clearly. <laughs> and um, there, there was... Uh, it was it. I went to the Mazzotti Synagogue. Do, do people know what the Mazzotti Synagogue? Probably don't. So you know you've got the liberal and reform, yeah. which is kind of like anything goes. Yeah. Then you've got the orthodox, which is kind of like nothing goes. <laughs> and then you've got the Mazzotti, which is kind of somewhere in between. It's kind of very Jewish. Just like, eh, you know. So that's Mazzotti. Uh, they're not, you know, so services generally in Hebrew and um, uh, Torah observant but not all orthodox in that way. And uh, the, the rabbi at this synagogue, New North London Synagogue, was the, pretty much the founder of the Mazzotti movement, Rabbi Louis Jacobs, a very famous rabbi. Anyway, I remember at my bar mitzvah him saying, well, now you're a good Jewish boy, and, uh, but you'll become a man, and you're going to be part of the community. And, you know, and I'm thinking, I'm never coming back. <laughs> Sorry, it was terrible. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I was really rebellious. I was like, you know, into... Um, alternative music and, and later on drugs and all of these things. And I'm, you know, trying, so I'm thinking, well, I'm, I'm actually much more interested in Buddhism and all these other things. So I was looking and looking and looking. But the very last thing I wanted to be was a Christian. I, I was, you know, vegetarian. I was looking into the I Ching. I was meditating. I was doing all sorts of other things. But Christian, that's joining the enemy. That's joining the other side to give you an, an understanding of what that means. When I, years, years, years later, said to my dad, I'm thinking of becoming a Christian, he said, I don't think I'll be able to speak to you again, right? He never said that about vegetarianism <laughs> or Buddhism. But, but so I um, had this very radical encounter years later with the Holy Spirit. I didn't know that, I had no context for Christianity or for praying to Jesus, what that did. I, I um, was filled with the Holy Spirit in a flat in Brixton, didn't know what it was, was praying in tongues, singing in what sounded like Arabic in my bathtub. I had no idea what it was. I only found out it was praying in tongues years later when I was in, in the new Christians class 
of the church where God very supernaturally put me in, and the very, very English pastor of the church is like, he's the most English Englishman, you know, he's like, David Harland is his name, and some of you may know him, he's like, they were praying, him and Jackie were praying for all the new Christians to start praying in tongues, and they're coming along, going, you know, and then he came to me, and I'm like, you know, fully praying in tongues, he's like, oh, he's off, you know, <laughs> but I was, I was thinking, oh, that's what that is, I had no idea, and I was telling people about Jesus, but I didn't think I'd become a Christian, I didn't know what that was, it, it, it's hard to explain, but I haven't got two for the price of one. <laughs> um, so, yeah, oh, it's all right. So I, have, I, ha, I, I didn't have a context for this. And so I, effectively what happened is I got born again, filled with the Holy Spirit, but not part of any church because I didn't know any Christians. And I tried to live in my old lifestyle, moved to Brighton as a student finally after five years. of I, I, I tipped over from that edge where... Um, I started off, you know, being an interesting character, and then at a certain point, you just become a bum, basically. You know, people just think you're, you've gone from being an interesting character to just, are you ever going to do anything with your life? You know, <laughs> so at that point, I moved to Brighton to go to university, um, and after a year there, I had a, another very supernatural encounter in which God woke me up with visions of a place, uh, took me out there to a meeting. Um, now it's, it's, I'm, I'm going to squeeze a long story short. Basically, God woke me up with visions of a place, took me out there. I didn't know what I was doing there. It turned out to be an outreach meeting of a church that only ever had one meeting in this place, that, in Lewis, in this town that God took me to, um, and only ever once did an outreach there. And the church was around the corner from where I lived in Hove. And it's the only big non-replacement theology church in Brighton Nobody told me about it. It, it, was a, it was quite a kind of unusual thing because they had this outreach and nobody came. No one. And so the guy preaching is a very supernatural guy. And God told him, there's a guy who's supposed to come tonight. He's called David. I want you, because this guy's called David, I want you to pray for him and pray that God will uh, bind up the darkness in his heart and pray for him to come to this meeting. And so this guy, David, who is a very, very prophetic guy, lovely guy, I still know him. And... Um, he uh, was praying. Now, at that point was the time when I woke up next to my then-girlfriend, feeling like my heart had been cut open, and having these visions of this place. And me being me, it took me till the evening to actually go there. But um, the thing is, he did this incredibly long altar call, which everyone else was thinking, why is he doing this? And he kept doing it, kept doing it, and eventually I came into the room, having been listening uh, uh, from outside anyway, Somehow or other, this Jewish boy is now the spiritual oversight for that church because it's the only church I've ever been in. And we've ended up uh, going, I've been, been as worship Dave. I've been kind of, a, we were young adult pastors. I met my wife there. We played Adam and Eve, actually, in a musical. Which <laughs> somehow seems appropriate. Um, and um, we were very chaste as Adam and Eve, just to be clear, um, because it was pre. But anyway... Um, and we are, then we were, we're young adult pastors for about seven years, and then associate pastors, and now we're the spiritual oversight. And that man, David and Jackie, they're the other spiritual oversight with us. Um, and, but all of this to say, I, this church was amazing because we had like Israel conferences, we had Barry and Batya Siegel were the first speakers there, with Lance Lambert, came, Michael Brown, Dwight Pryor. I mean, they all came through our church for these conferences. And I was always the token Jew playing guitar because I was a guitar player. And Barry and Batty would always get like these top, top bands, you know, like, I know. And they would always come to the thing and they'd be like, we haven't got a guitarist, would you play guitar? And so I was always like, sure, you know. And I am a singer-songwriter, but the, they, got, the, they were these top musicians and I was always there kind of, you know. But it meant that I was in these conferences hearing about this Jewish stuff and in a church which wasn't replacement theology, but nonetheless, I was still looking for, it's like being back in synagogue, um, I, was still looking for my, I was still looking for my Jewish identity. I learned about being a good Pentecostal Christian, I learned even about having a heart for Israel, right? but, but my identity as a Jewish believer, I didn't really fully discover that, and people would still say things that made, meant they were very suspicious of me doing anything Jewish. Why would you want to go back to the law, yeah. right? So, so 
gradually I began to look into this and study and look for myself because I, I found this, that, that if you start with Israel, you don't always get Jesus. I don't know if you found that. Yeah. That's where some people can go off the deep end a bit yeah. because it somehow is a disconnected thing from their identity as a believer, as a Gentile believer or a Jewish, but whatever. But, but if you start with Jesus and you discover the Jewishness of Jesus and you move further into that, then you always end up coming to a place where you realize if Jesus is still Jewish, then how does God feel about the Jewish people now? How does he feel about his brothers and sisters, right? So long story short, after years, I found that having done Jewish roots teaching, I found that what my passion was was really to bring this to the next generation, right? Because you come to any conference like this, and I think we can see it is lacking, yes? Yeah. And I know, I think we're all on the same page in having a passion that this would not be something that is, is just, you know, because because actually this, this love of Israel, this understanding that you're, you have, is not something that is being transmitted easily to the next generations. And I wanted to write a, a book that would be accessible to anyone, even an 18, the average 18-year-old, and give them the foundation. And so I ended up writing this book called The Jewish Jesus. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I, de well, I don't know how good it is, but I definitely felt it was a God thing, because God had said to me, through this prophet who came through our church, and he stopped in the middle of his speaking. He said, you with the beard. He's Scottish. That was supposed to be a Scottish accent. He said, um, you've got an anointing like Jeremiah to teach the things of your people. He, I'd never met him. Teach the things of your people to the church, right? And he just went and did a long kind of thing. Anyway, I got to know him. He's a, a very dour Scottish prophet. But he did say this to me. He said, I see um, God's going to open doors to, to Jewish ministry when you have a child. And so I was thinking, well, great, we're, we're trying to have a child, me and my wife. Now, it took us a little while to have a child. I won't go into the details, but six, seven years later, I got a publishing contract for this book four weeks after my uh, son was born. So, so it was right, really like a God thing. You know, I just knew it was... Well. And one of the things about this book is I wanted it to look both contemporary and, you know, I didn't want it to have flying Torah scrolls. Somehow Christian publishers have this amazing ability to let, make books look like they were published 20 years yeah. before, they, before, before today. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I was like, so I got my friend who's like an um, Instagram person, very, very, you know, cool designer, to, to sort of do a, a knock up this. And I wrote the book in a way that I wanted it to be accessible because... Um, I, didn't, I resisted writing the book, but I felt like God wanted me to write a book that brought together those three things, the Jewishness of Jesus, God's heart for Israel, and what it looks like for the church to be composed of Jewish and Gentile believers together. What does that really look like? Because these are the things that have been lost. Um, so, um, it, so that's what I did. And um, I found that it, it did seem to um, find a place because there's great books about the Jewishness of Jesus. There are. The, you know, Lois Furberg's books are great. There's, there's lots of books. And there's great books about Israel, and there's great books about the church. But there aren't many that bring the three things together and link them. And God showed me it's a series of three lenses that when you actually turn the lens and you bring into the detail the Jewishness of Jesus, and you restore that context and that understanding, that then leads you to another lens which says, well, now hold on, that's been a bit blurry here. What does God, if Jesus is still Jewish, because as... Who was it who was saying Jesus? Um, David Blake. Yeah, was saying, you know, Jesus was Jewish. Jesus and, and, is, yeah. yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. If you say to people Jesus is Jewish, they'll say, oh, yeah, of course. But what they really mean is Jesus was Jewish. Yeah. Like yeah. he went through a sort of Jewish phase yeah. 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 and came like a teenager and came out the other end. <laughs> it's like, uh, I've grown out of that Jewish stuff, you know? T Christians live because of this legacy. Christians live with a... Uh, this cognitive dissonance, don't we? We live with the Old Testament, New Testament, but it's all the word of God. Angry God, grace-filled, loving God, but the same yesterday, today, and forever. Yes? Yeah. And, and so this kind of stuff helps square the circle, really. Helps us understand better. And, and even as a Jewish person, I was asking God, well, what does this look like? How do I understand this 
um, knowledge, why I'm thinking I need to study some deep theolo- theology. And God said to me, rewire. Read without religion. That's all you want to do. In other words, the problem is not that you need to read deep things into the text. The problem is you need to take off the lenses of tradition and then you will see really clearly. It's like, how do you avoid... I, I was speaking in this church in America where I had a meeting with these pastors. It's one of these mega churches. And he, to start this meeting, this, one of these guys just said to me, so, the Jewish Jesus, like, what that's all about then? Which to, yeah, which to me is like a, such a funny question. Now, really nice. He was not, you know, because Americans can say those kind of things. and they're not, they're not being... He wasn't being sarcastic. He was genuinely asking. So I said, well, can I ask you a question? He's like, yeah. So, you read a Jewish book, yes? Written by Jews, mostly about Jews, mostly written for Jews. You follow a Jewish man and the teachings of his Jewish disciples. Surely the real question is, how did you miss the Jewish stuff? Yeah. <laughs> right? Because it's a weird thing. The biggest, you've heard, you know what the phrase cultural appropriation means? It's, a, it's where you take on all the symbols and everything else of another person's culture without acknowledging the source. And it's this thing that's quite kind of trendy to talk about. Well, the biggest act of cultural appropriation is with the, the church and the Jewish Bible and the Jewish symbols and all of the Jewish stuff that it does that it's severed itself from a lot of the time, of course. So, so anyway, in, in, in doing this, my, my feeling is that we just need to lift off our traditions, those lenses that color everything with kind of old, new, you know, because God didn't quote the Old Testament, New Testament. He didn't go, my first try was good, but, you know, I think I can write something better, something more gripping, you know, with better ending. Let's, let's get, you know, it's, that's not it, is it? Yeah, and, and the scriptures that we call the Old Testament, the, the G- disciples of Jesus called the Word of God. Yeah. So, so somehow or other, we're missing a lot of stuff, aren't we? And my thing is, is... It's not worth restoring just because it's Jewish. It's worth restoring because it will help us to discover who we are, who God is, who we're called to be, how we accomplish what J. John was talking about this morning of reaching the world. And so um, taking off those lenses, it's all there in the text that begins to speak to us. And so the, the book does it in, in those three areas. It's the subtitle is Reconnecting with the Truth about Jesus, Israel, and the Church. And I thought I was going to move on to do a book about emotional wholeness because that's been a big part of what I've done. I've been trained as a social worker, worked as a social worker. I've had these different careers. I think I'm just indecisive, so musician, social worker, preacher. But, but, but God stopped me in my tracks and put in me this thing of 52 Sabbaths. I wanted to write 52 Sabbaths. And I was like, OK. Um, and I, he downloaded a few to me, so I started writing them. And I thought, OK, yeah, this is it. And um, and then I didn't do it, right? And I didn't do it for a whole year. Uh, so God spoke to me in December 2018. I didn't do it through the whole of 2019. Then I came to sort of the beginning of 2020, and I was praying. I was like, oh, God, I'm sorry I didn't do that. And I think I missed, missed the boat there. And, you know, I'll, I'll, and, and I felt God speak to me from Ezekiel. And it's a scripture that says, Honor, uh, observe my Sabbath, keep them holy, something like that, something about the Sabbath. And um, I don't know, I don't know, it's not part of my present, but the point is God spoke to me in this verse about the Sabbath, and I was about to close, I opened my Bible, I was reading it, wow, yeah. I was about to close my Bible, and God said, no, look at the number. And I was like, oh, and it was Ezekiel 2020. And God said to me, 2020 is the year I want you to do it. So I, that's what I did for a year, is I wrote 52 Sabbaths, which after about 10 Sabbaths, it suddenly occurred to me I was actually writing a new book. Um, which seems obvious on reflection, but at the time I was just like, well, I'll just write these reflections. But it turned out to be big. And I thought, oh, my goodness, you know, after a few, you've done a few obvious ones, and after a few I'm thinking, this is a lot of stuff to get out of the Sabbath, but you know what? I didn't use all of what I had, because the more you unwrap the Sabbath, the more you realize this is a massive key to what God has got for his people and how we represent him right? It's much neglected. Its prominence in the Bible is out of all proportion to what we think of it as. 24 hours of rest, nice. If you look in the Bible, God's judgment on the people of Israel is so often related to 
not keeping the Sabbath, and all that that connects with, which we'll talk, we'll talk about in this presentation. Present what are we calling it? Are we calling it work presentation? Seminar? Workshop? Happening? Hey, event? I don't know. Um, so, um, so why... Suspicion, yes. Now, what I found, right, is that the church has, what we've done often is we've thrown out the baby with the bathwater when it comes to um, everything to do with the Torah. Yeah, we've thrown out the baby of faith-filled action with the bathwater of legalistic observance. Yes? And, and my intention is to bring the baby back, as it were. Uh, and I think it's, it's a funny thing, isn't it? Because people are so suspicious if you start talking about the Sabbath, just like, well... Why would you want to return to the law? Which is a funny, funny question, right? Um, why would you want to return to the law? But it's, if you look at those early disciples, the apostles say, they're really excitedly saying to Paul, they say, hey, how many countless Jewish believers, how, how many Jews have become believers, and they're all zealous for the Torah? They think it's a good thing. We, the the modern-day Christian can't compute that, right? Because that just doesn't fit. Why, why would they want to return to the law, you know? But they're not returning to something. They are continuing to live out the word of God in their lives. The new covenant was, I will write my Torah in their hearts and in their minds. And I think it's because we have this misunderstanding of the teaching of Jesus. That's where it starts, where we go, Jesus came to set up something completely new. Right? But this is not correct. Jesus' teaching was about how we fulfill the heart of the Torah, not whether it's valid or not. Hopefully we'll understand that more as we go through. We operate from a different place, yes? When Jesus said, though, my burden is easy, my yoke is light, his yoke is the teaching of a rabbi, Right? It's his halakha, it's how you walk out the commandments of God. He's not hippie Jesus saying, oh, that stuff, oh, no, 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 we were having a bad day. Me and the father, we'd had an argument in the morning, we wrote the Torah in the afternoon. Sorry about that. My yoke's easy. That is, what, that is actually how Christians kind of understand it generally. But that isn't at all what he's saying. What he's saying is my halakha, my rabbinical interpretation of this is the right interpretation. And the Jews had always said that the Messiah, when he came, would bring out the full meaning of the Torah. And that's precisely what Jesus is saying. Hey, I'm the one. I'm come to do that. Their astonishment at him was not his techniques of teaching. It was the fact that he didn't refer to other rabbinical authority. He just referred to his father. Other rabbis would say, Rabbi so-and-so says this, and Rabbi so-and-so says this. Jesus said, my father. Yeah? So, so in we need to get this... Foundation, because then when we come in to understand the, the Sabbath, we need to have this in mind. Because most people's understanding of the Sabbath is this. Jesus came to the Jewish people, and the, the Jewish people said to him, why aren't you keeping the Sabbath? And he said, the Sabbath, that's old. Man, why are you so heavy about the Sabbath, right? Just chill out, right? It's all about love. That is what most people sort of think. Yeah, this legalistic stuff, don't worry about that. And then he said to the Pharisees, you, you're telling people to keep the Sabbath, what's that about, right? That's more or less, I mean, I'm using colloquial language, but that's more or less how Christians sort of see it when you say, have you thought about the Sabbath? Well, Jesus told us not, you know, we don't have to worry about it. So he's the Lord of the Sabbath, and he's my Sabbath. So like, all, I've got my bases covered, I don't need to worry about the Sabbath. But that isn't what Jesus is saying at all. Jesus says to them, you place heavy burdens that you can't li lift yourselves. You don't help them lift onto the people. But he's never saying to them, the problem, is not, um, the problem is not that they are observing the Sabbath. The problem is how they are observing the Sabbath. The problem is not that they're teaching people to observe the Torah commandments of the Sabbath. The problem is that they set up an oral tradition, a fence it was called, with hundreds of regulations around the Sabbath that were added on top of God's commandments. And they are criticizing his disciples and him for disobeying those things. 
right? Okay, so let's get into the Sabbath a little bit more. See, I think the problem is our mindset. People will say to me, do I have to observe the Sabbath? And there's two problems with that. One is, if you say, do I have to observe the Sabbath, it means you're looking to get as close to the line as possible, right? How close to the line can I get before God will judge me and say, no, 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 back over the line, yes? But that is the literal opposite of the teaching of Jesus. Because if you want to sum up the Sermon on the Mount, Dwight Pryor said this, sum up the Sermon on the Mount, it's go beyond the minimum. So the second problem is that is it's a misunderstanding of the Sabbath. Because the Sabbath is a holiday. Holy day, the Sabbath is a holiday. So if you say, do I have to observe the Sabbath? It's kind of like saying, do I have to have, a day? Do I have, to do the, have this holiday? Really? <laughs> now, my kids are five and two. They don't have any problem going on holiday. Yeah? They would never say, do I have to go on holiday? <laughs> but for some reason, we are suspicious. Now, um, Jesus, you know what I found? The more I studied, the more I looked in the Bible, the more I realized the problem is not. Or the, see, we think that Jesus came with something completely different. The issue that Jesus had with the Pharisees is that he knew the word better than them. He knew the Torah better than them. It's not that he came with a different Torah. It's that he's like, no, you, you don't understand it. You don't know it, you don't understand it, and you don't understand the heart of the Father in this, and I'm going to show people the heart of the Father. So when we see him healing on the Sabbath, it's not because he's like, the Sabbath doesn't matter. He's like, no, no, that's totally in line with what the Sabbath is about. When we see, let's, let's read what our, our foundational scripture. Here we go. Remember, this is the command. Ten commandments. Remember the to observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. You have six days each week for your ordinary work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath day of rest dedicated to the Lord your God. On that day, no one in your household may do any work. This includes you, your sons and daughters, your male and female servants, your livestock, and any foreigners living among you. For in six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth, sorry, the heavens, the earth, the sea, and everything in them. But on the seventh day, he rested. That's why the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and set it apart as holy. And the things that the Pharisees were angry about, first thing to notice, they were nothing to do with the people's ordinary work. Yes? Um, Jesus says this in his argument with the Pharisees, right? He finally comes down to say this. He says, look, let's sum it up. The Sabbath was made to meet the needs of the people and not people to meet the requirements of the Sabbath. But he was actually essentially paraphrasing what God had told Moses to tell the people of Israel. Because some of the people of Israel, if you remember, they went out on the seventh day and they were looking for manna. And I love what God says through Moses. God says, it's like God's like, what don't they get about this? And he says, they must realize the Sabbath is the Lord's gift to you. Like, what is this that they don't understand here? You know, so Jesus is essentially saying that it's a gift. And so my whole thing is, the, 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 the basis of 52 Sabbaths, this free online resource, is unwrapping the gift of the Sabbath. Because it's a really silly question, if someone gives you a gift, is do I have to have it? Do I have to unwrap it? And you don't even know what it is. Eh, do I have to? They'd be like, well, no, but it's like a really expensive gift, you know? And it's actually personally handcrafted for you. Now, if God gives you a gift, it's even dumber to say, do I have to, isn't it? Yes? I mean, it's weird. Right, so um, let's, and, and the thing is this, the Sabbath commandment is four verses out of 16 verses that the Ten Commandments take up. It's a quarter of the verses on the Sabbath. Uh, so, so now, some people have called it nine commandments and a suggestion. Because the Sabbath is the only one that Christians boast about breaking. Yeah. And um, here's the thing. Which of the Ten Commandments did Jesus say, let's dial down on this a little bit? Which of them did Jesus say, you know what? A little bit of murder's all right. You're under grace now. You know? His whole thing, go beyond the minimum, was 
you need to exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees because all they do is kind of legalistically observe and try and get around things and get as close to the line. He's like, you are supposed to live out the heart of the Father. My, my followers are going to live out the commandments of God. It's not enough to not murder and pat yourself on the back. I didn't kill anyone today. What an awesome man I am. No, no, no. He says you have to, it, you have to love everyone. In fact, you have to go radical, love your enemies. He says adultery. He doesn't say a little bit of adultery. Not such a bad thing. Come on, guys. You're under grace now. You see what I'm saying? Absolute opposite. He says it's your heart. It's not just, you can't just pat yourself on the back for not committing adultery. You need to have pure hearts, and your heart needs to be being purified. So somehow we understand that, and yet with the Sabbath, we're like, yeah, but the Sabbath, I mean, that's just different, isn't it? Because it's Jewish. <laughs> right? So here's the thing. Do you know what the very first thing that God calls holy is? The Sabbath. See, there are things that he calls holy. He calls his people holy. He calls his land holy. But the first thing he calls holy is this block of time, 24-hour period, the Sabbath. And so it must be very important to God and very important to us. We see it. It's funny. We see it's, it's almost its nature in that it's weekly. seems to make it more mundane than, say, the festivals that we know and study more, like Passover and Sukkot. But the punishment for breaking the Sabbath was the most severe punishment. Because to God, it's very, very important. Why is this? It's because it's, it's, it's very ordinariness, it's very weakly nature makes it so important for making God's people stand out. And for so much else that we're going to look at, it's clearly of real importance. It's part of the fabric of routine. The Jewish people have this saying that they, the Jewish people haven't kept the Sabbath. The Sabbath has kept the Jewish people. Yes. One of the key things that has kept the Jewish people for all these thousands of years has been the Sabbath. In Exodus 13... Hold on. Oh, yeah. Okay, I didn't put this... It's a bonus scripture for you. There you go. Uh, Exodus 31, 13. Tell the people of Israel, be careful to keep my Sabbath day, for the Sabbath is a sign of the covenant between you, me and you from generation to generation. It's given so that you, are, you may know that I am the Lord who makes you holy. So God makes the Sabbath holy, and then he makes his people holy. It says keep the Sabbath. It's, uh, you can enter into it, and it reminds you each week that I, you, I'm the one who made you holy. See, we are ambassadors and we have to understand that we are set apart for his use and the, the sabbath has caused his people to stand out through the centuries it still causes the jewish people to stand out in the world you go to israel everything stops yeah. it's an amazing thing because we don't have that anymore and you know the sabbath was it was revolutionary and it was very unheard of in the ancient world and it was not easy. For us, it's more easy. We know it's the weekend and so on. But in a society which depended on harvest cycles, planting cycles, it was not an easy thing. And God specifically says to them, in the midst of your harvest season, keep the Sabbath. Now, that was a much more challenging thing and counterintuitive and countercultural in the Middle East. We've always got to understand what the intent of the Torah is. Because God still calls us to be countercultural, but it might look different, yes? And the Sabbath might not mean that we have fields with barley lying vacant, but it might mean something that translates from that into what it looks like today. That's what I want to look at. So I've, I've said I'm going to look at three areas. I said it now. Self, family, community, and society. And I want to leave some time for a few questions, is that good? Not really tricky ones or anything. I don't want to leave too much time because, <laughs> no, I'm sure I'm happy with any question. You can always ask me questions afterwards as well. Um, so, but first of all, let's think about self. Now, have I put this? No, I haven't. Okay, my, I, I, I would describe my slides as not exhaustive. Is that okay? Um, I've already read this scripture, so I'm just going to reread it to you. Uh, Genesis 2, 1 to 3. 
So the creation of the heavens and the earth and everything in them was completed. On the seventh day, God had finished his work of creation, so he rested from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy because it was the day from, he rested from all his work of creation. So notice this, that the Sabbath predates the Torah. Yes? The Sabbath was created, but it predates the Torah. And God says, honor the Sabbath because it's part of my nature. I created for six days and rested on the seventh day, and you are made in my image. The Sabbath is a reminder that we are made in the image of God each week. It connects us with the very creation of the heavens and the earth. And it connects us with the creation of ourselves. It reminds us of our actual identity, whatever else we're doing. And so that's, I think, the vital starting place. God has given us the Sabbath to remind us who we are and who he is, that we're made in his image. It's part of the operating instructions. It's when people say, why would you want to go back to the law? It's like, no, no, no. God gave us the Sabbath because he wants us to be fruitful. He's not an arbitrary rule giver. The Torah is not given to the people of Israel as a kind of set of like, "Mm," and you have to wear ties backwards. Uh, What else can be difficult? You have to, you know, it's like, that's not God just setting arbitrary rules. He's saying, I want to create a society and a community that is going to represent me on the face of the earth as my ambassadors. You will be to me a holy nation, a people set apart. You are to represent me. So all of this that he's giving us is for that purpose. And the Sabbath is no exception. I'm just, in a way... With the 52 Sabbaths, what I'm doing is I'm taking this one area and doing what I'm talking about in this book for this one area. But I would say we can do that in lots of it. Lots of what we've looked at. So, um, if you think about the Ten Commandments, or let's let's think about this. Jesus was asked to sum sum up the Torah at the time. Sum up the Torah. Now, he said... Basically, two commandments. Love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, as an aside, let's just be clear. If somebody asks me to sum up my book, and I say it's all about rediscovering the Jewishness of Jesus, that doesn't mean that they don't need to bother reading the book. Because that's quite often how Christians hear that. You you know what I'm saying? Jesus isn't saying, don't worry about the Torah. It's all about love. He's saying, you ask me to sum it up, I'll sum it up. Everything comes down to these two things. But here's the thing. The first three of the Ten Commandments are all about loving God. And and the the last ones are all about actually how to love others. But the Sabbath is the pivot that connects them all. It connects them. It's the only one that's really explicitly about all three. And so what I've found is that we lose this bit, love others as you love yourself which kind of implies we need to learn what it really means to love ourselves. And in my work as a social worker and in my work as a pastor and in my life, generally what I found is that we tend to treat others the way we think God is treating us. And experiencing the love of God and learning what it means to really love ourselves, not in an egotistical, you know, proud way, but actually love ourselves the way that God intends us to is very, very important. And the Sabbath is a vital part of learning what it is to love yourself so that you can love others. Now, loving ourselves, we know, comes from experiencing God's love. Learning to treat ourselves neither more highly nor more more lowly than we ought. So, um, a few things about the Sabbath Trying to block out the uh, others. No, no, it's all good. Um, But I think the Sabbath is a good barometer of of our relationship with God. See, the Sabbath is not a pause between weeks. It is the culmination of the week. If you think about creation, God created for six days. On the sixth day, he created man. And on the seventh day... He created the Sabbath. In fact, the rabbis say this, that God created everything, and then he said there's something missing, and he created the Sabbath. And you think the first thing he created, he creates man, and the first thing man enters into is Sabbath. So so the Sabbath is not seen as the kind of 
the way we see it as a kind of just, a kind of pause between the two weeks. It's actually the culmination of each week's effort. It's the stepping into something. Um, do you know the word, you know, it says that we, we read in our Bible, it says, God rested on the seventh day. That's not actually true. God did not get in a hammock and go, oh, the last bit, right? Well, I took on two, the last bit was really exhausting. I mean, the rest was, the mountains were okay, but man, oh, that took it out of me. I'm going to just, you know, bring me a latte. Um, that was not what it really means. The word Sabbath really means to stop with a sense of having arrived at a destination. And that is very important because that is essential to the Jewish understanding of the Sabbath and that we would get that understanding that the Sabbath is not simply our uh, rest. It's, there is that element, but really it's the culmination of our week. See, God, it, it, the Sabbath speaks of a God who not simply creates but enters into a relationship with his creation. He enjoys the creation on the seventh day. He, he says, I'm going to step into my creation he, no, he isn't just creating it and going, okay, well, you get on with it now. He creates this thing, the Sabbath, and he says this is a holy day where we commune. Um, and there is supposed to be this sense of anticipation in Jewish thinking that Sabbath is thought of as a bride. It's interesting, the Sabbath, because it's, it's actually an act of faith, isn't it? To stop and put everything back in God's hand. See, we think uh, part of the problem that we have as Christians is we've inherited a framework that says faith is what Christians have and works is what Jews have. Yes? yes? But the just shall live by their faith wasn't spoken to Christians, it was spoken to Jews. Yeah. Yes? The, the, this idea that faith is what Christians have and Jewish people, that were they never called to have faith, that's not correct. Even N.T. Wright, who I think is still replacement theology, says that the Torah was never given as a kind of means of salvation. It's given as a, as a covenant together with God. You know, it's actually written like a ketubah, a, a marriage contract. So, so um, this thing of the Sabbath is actually an, a weekly act of faith that we step into rest. We don't stop because we finished. We stop because we put our trust back in who God says we are and in God's hands we put back our work and our, all of that we're doing. Abraham Joshua Heschel, great theologian, wrote a wonderful book called The Sabbath, which if you want to read a book on the Sabbath, is beautiful, really wonderful. He calls the Sabbath a cathedral in time. And I think that's really nice. Great, think of it. And so um, a traditional Jewish greeting on the, on the Sabbath is Shabbat Shalom. But Shalom is more than just the absence of conflict. Shalom is about wholeness. It's about the presence of God. It's about fullness. And so let's think about just, yes, quickly for ourselves, some things that the Sabbath represents. I put, can you see a theme? Ah, all, all the rees. They just came out like that, wasn't it? But we've got rest. Take a break from your ordinary work. Jesus' whole thing is like, listen, stop adding all these regulations that then turn it back into a burden. It's like you take this beautiful thing and go, wait, no, let's... It's, it's almost like God goes, have a holiday, one day a week. Stop doing what you do. You don't have to do the harvest. You don't have to collect food. Just spend some time with me. Spend time in you. And, and we're like, great. Oh, can we do this? God's like, it's okay, don't worry about it. Oh, oh can we do this? Can we... What about the, I tell you what, God, what we'll do, just to make it clear, we'll write down all the rules that we, what we can and can't do. And God's like, what? <laughs> what are you doing, right? Because his thing is just don't do your ordinary work. Take a rest. There's a few other things he adds, but not much. Um, so, but for us, I think this is so important. More than ever, I think the Sabbath is relevant. Take a rest from trying to make your way trying to prove yourself, prove your worth from creating, from trying to climb to the top of a ladder. The Sabbath redefines our relationship to work. When I was looking into writing these Sabbaths, one of the things I realized is, you know, it's too easy for us to think that work is a curse. 
But work is a blessing. And Jewish people never have had that idea that work is a curse. It's never been in their thinking. It isn't today. My goodness, there are more deals done in synagogue than in business places. <laughs> I remember, like, in synagogue, and people are like, you know, the rabbis are like, and then there's people going, so, uh, you know, about that new, uh, you know. <laughs> so, but, but the point is this. Toil was the curse. Work is always a blessing in Jewish thinking. And we need to rediscover that. We really do. Because when you rediscover that, you rediscover, oh, my identity and purpose is in my work, but it's God's identity in me because it's not separate from my spiritual life. It's a blessing. Work is a blessing, right? So the Sabbath isn't about escaping the curse of work because work isn't a curse. But it is about escaping the, 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 the curse of toil. Yes? Which is work without joy. And the Sabbath is all about entering into a rest that says, I remember that God is my source. I, I remember that this work isn't my source. And rest and trust go together. Do you know Psalm 23 is recited at the end of the Sabbath? So it, it, there's a link between rest and trust, isn't there? When we learn to rest in God, we learn to trust him more. Jesus said, abide in me. The more I look at what Jesus said, the more I realize he was, everything he says drips with the Torah. It drips with what we call the Old Testament. He just doesn't quote chapter and verse because that's not how rabbis taught. They would just make allusion to verses and to themes. You know, the sheep and the goats. It's in Ezekiel. It's not like Jesus went, I know, well, let's do sheep and goats. <laughs> you know? Uh, so, so, so in this, in all that he's saying about these rest things, they hear it in that framework, this context of the Sabbath is coming through all the time. Uh, recharge, we refill the tank, body, soul, and spirit. And we've got to understand is this, that Jewish thinking isn't se doesn't separate body and soul. It doesn't have these separations, right? Because in Jewish thinking, work is good, sex is good, food is good, food is good, food is, you know. <laughs> so, so, so Jewish thinking is like, is, is not, and people misunderstand Paul when Paul talks about the flesh and the spirit as though he's talking about the flesh is like everything that's can't, oh, you know. But actually in Jewish thinking, the flesh is everything that isn't, isn't yielded to God. It's not so simple as like, he's not a, a Greek dualist kind of going, going, you know, there's all this spiritual realm and then there's this terrible uh, earthly realm we have to escape from, you know, because the thing is, God's coming back to the earthly realm, yeah. right? So, so our thinking needs a little bit of shaking up. Um, so in the recharging, um, these, are, these are good things. These are not unspiritual things, if I can put it that way. Um, and stress comes when we have no margin, physically, spiritually, or emotionally, and that's the kind of society we've ended up in, I think, a lot. Um, what time do we, does this go till? Oh, it does. Yeah, good. Yeah, I suddenly had this feeling like I've got 10 minutes. Oh, no. Um, but no, uh, so, so recharge, relax. There is this sense of enjoy the fruits of your labor. I've, I've got this uh, outline for a book on Ecclesiastes that I've written. I've written the outline, not the book, unfortunately. But um, well, I, I went through a bit of a difficult time, and I've, I began to... You know, I was just that kind of dark night of the soul thing about uh, after the book came out, after about a year afterwards, after I'd been... And it was just like, what's going on and what, what's happening in me? And I found that what brought me out of it after about a year, 18 months... Anybody ever been through anything like that? Yeah. I think God takes you through these things because he strips you of everything and things that used to work don't seem to work. But anyway, what brought me out of it, of all books, was the book of Ecclesiastes, which is not known to be the most cheery book. <laughs> But actually, God began to show me it's a, it's a terrible book if you're trying to make your way in the world. You know? But it's a great book if you're actually trying to understand your place in the world. Yeah. And, and not in a depressing way, genuinely in a liberating way. You know, it, says, it says God makes the same thing happen over and over again, which is depressing in some ways. But in another way, it's quite refreshing because it's like eh, you don't have to come up with anything like massively original and new. Just fear God and do what God's calling you to do because there's nothing new. And... It, God's just kind of bringing things around in circles, you know, let's do this again, you know. <laughs> but, but, but in a good way. Um, anyway, one of the things that Ecclesiastes says is enjoy the fruits of your labor. 
it's a good thing to enjoy the fruits of your labor. Like, just don't get, don't get sucked into thinking that your labor is producing the ultimate meaning, but enjoy it. It's a blessing. And so the Sabbath teaches us to actually enjoy the fruits of our labor. It brings us back to the why. It's going back to this idea of creation. It says in Genesis 1.31, And God saw everything he had made, and indeed it was very good. So it's evening and morning were the sixth day. So he, he goes, everything's really good. Hmm, I'm going to create the Sabbath and spend a day enjoying it. Yeah. <laughs> Next thing, remember. There's a massive connection between remembering and the Sabbath. Um, remember, it's God who made you. Whatever else defines us in the week, ultimately the Sabbath brings us back to our true identity. And this is one of the reasons that God says to the children of Israel, you're forgetting to observe the Sabbaths. Because when you forget to observe the Sabbaths, you forget who you are. In Deuteronomy 5.15, it says this, Remember, you were once slaves in Egypt, but the Lord your God brought you out with his strong hand and powerful arm. That is why the Lord your God has commanded you to rest on the seventh day. Have I got that? No, I don't. I seem to have... My, my si assistant has not put as many slides in as he should have. Oh. <laughs> it's actually me. I'm um, but look, there's just the odd scripture that I seem to... Um, but listen, yeah, God says, that's why I commanded you to rest on the Sabbath day. Remember that you were once slaves in Egypt. Remember, it was me who rescued you. Remember, it was me who made you my people. It, remember, it was my power that changed your life. Remember, it's, it's me who brought you through the wilderness. Remember, it's me who took you into the promised land. And therefore, it's me who will take you into everything that I've got for your life. It's not the work you've been doing those five days. That's great. I'm in that. But remember, remember, remember each week, it's really me. It's me who's brought you out of Egypt. It's me who take, took you through the wilderness, purified your heart, and is still doing that. It's me who carried you into the promised land and into your destiny. And if you're not there yet, or if you're struggling, it's me who's going to be with you. So there's this. The Sabbath is so powerful. In Jewish thinking, the uh, Sabbath is supposed to be a taste of the Messianic kingdom. How much more for us as actual followers of Jesus can it be a taste of the Messianic kingdom if we, if we understand what it means and use it right? A um, couple more, and then we'll move on to family and community. Repair. I think the Sabbath is kind of like a garage for life. You know? It's, it's a block of time that you've actually got where you can, you can actually notice the things that have come up in the week. Let's reflect on that a little bit. What, what actually... Are you doing in my life, God? What do you need to do? Now, I'm not saying we only do it then, right? But here's the thing about the Sabbath, and here's the thing about God and Jewish people generally, right? I, I was flying to, I, uh, to Israel when that volcano erupted in Iceland. Our flight, me and my wife were at the airport. Our flight was at 12 o'clock. They announced that the airport was shutting and everyone had to go from, from 12 o'clock. Literally from 12 o'clock. It was the same time. Anyway, everyone else in the airport uh, was going, like getting their bags. They'd been told. That's it. You could see the Israeli pilots and uh, with all the Orthodox people sort of around them arguing with the authorities. And you could hear, you, you, I just couldn't hear them, but you could, wait, but if we fly through the volcano of smoke, it's okay, yes? No, no, the, you don't understand. The airport's shut. Yes, but we have to go. So if we... Everyone else had gone, and, they, and they, you, could, you could see it, and they were getting really het up. And, they were, and, and the thing is, God is so much more practical-minded than Christians. <laughs> Jewish people are so much more down-to-earth than Christians. CMJ as an organization, if we're talking about evangelizing Jewish people, it's like what you believe is not that important. I mean, it's important to you, and it's important, but it's only as important as it changes what you do. See, and, and I'm only saying what James said. Like, what good is your faith if it doesn't change the way you act? Only saying what Jesus said. He said, be hearers and doers. And we hear that and we go, oh, yeah, that's not. But it's really about what we believe. It's faith because we're justified by faith. And God's like, no, 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 well, yes, but no. 
right? The sheep and goats weren't separated on the basis of, well, you know, you read, you read a book, it was, mm. you read a different book, didn't you? Mm. Yes? Like, I do think there is a cor course correction coming, because I think our understanding of these things is a little bit, yeah, I'm not, don't get me wrong, I'm not like saying, um, but there's this paradox is what I'm saying, is that God always says, yes, but your works need to reflect your faith. And if your works don't change, then your faith is kind of not what you think it is. Yeah. Right? If you encounter Jesus, you don't have to become perfect, but if you don't change at all, which Jesus did you encounter? Yeah. Yes? I mean, I think... <laughs> look, it's, we're on dangerous territory, right? Theologically, we could go lots of different places here. But all I'm saying is that with the Sabbath, God is very practical. And you get a lot of people who will say, well, you know, I'm a believer and Jesus is my Sabbath and I don't need the Sabbath. But God's like, yes, but you do. It's kind of like going to the gym. You kind of go, listen, well, you know. But it's like, no, if you don't go regularly, you won't get bigger muscles. There's no two ways about it. And if you don't have a regular time, you'll find three months has gone and you haven't been. Or in my case, you get a gym membership and then a year later you go, I'm going to cancel my gym membership because I haven't been, right? But my point is that God gives us this block of time and he says, do it regularly. And yeah, do, it, do some other stuff as well. So it's not to be legalistic so much as God is very practical. And we need to actually understand and follow. See, somebody said to me, is it about rules? And I said, it's more about rhythm than rules. It's about us walking in rhythm with God because we're God's people. This is in his nature. He did it. He showed us how to do it. And now he says, you do it. And we say, well, do I have to do it? And he's like, you know, we, we miss the point. So it's a weekly course correction. And what does this practically look like? For, for us, I think, for me and Denise, we, we grow an understanding because people get very romantic about this, you know. And the, the, the woman needs to usher in the presence of God and all these things. And that's fine. You know, like I'm Jewish and I, I didn't really grow up with that. Um, and, and so, I, you know, what I want is to find the essence of the, Shabbat, of the Sabbath for me and my family. I want to, my kids to know that I prioritize them. We're going to come on to family in a second. I, I want to find what that looks like. I'm, not, I'm terrible with rituals because I'm not a rule follower, and I'm not like a big traditionalist, and I, like, I get bored easily. <laughs> so my wife and I, yes, we get challah from the local bakery, and yes, we open wine, occasionally we open beer, but generally speaking, occasionally we don't open anything, but, <laughs> and generally speaking, we end up you know, trying to pick food up off the floor, because our two-year-old really loves throwing food on the floor, <laughs> amongst other things. And um, we've got two very different children, one five and one two. One five who is so neat that is like nothing, and the other one who's like, oh, it's just like, did you get any of that in your mouth? So, you know, I don't have this romantic notion of these things, and I'm not looking to, um, you know, I, I don't think that that, because sometimes Christians want to adopt Jewish symbols, yeah. and I'm like, that's fine if it helps you, but only if it helps you to really find the essence of the Sabbath for you, for you, for your life. What does that look like? Because the biblical, a lot of the, the Jewish rabbinical stuff, some of it's great, some of it's got so much wisdom in it, all of that, all for that. But some of it's, you know, it's not necessarily biblical, all of it. Yes? It's not like God says, and you must bake a bread that looks like this. You know, it must have poppy seeds on it. Some of them could have not poppy seeds on. And this is, you know, this isn't, this, we have to understand that if you want to adopt those things, do it. But do it with the right understanding. Don't, don't get the symbols but miss the heart. Get the heart and the symbols if you want. Yeah. Yes? So when I'm talking about this, that's why, so I, that's why some people read the 52 Sabbaths. Now, there's lots of Jewish learning in there, right? References to the occasional... To, to Jewish stuff. It's not that there isn't that. But what there isn't is a how to do the Sabbath in a Jewish way. You know? I'm not trying to get Christians to be like rabbinical Jews. So um, weekly course correction. And then, so for us, it looks like intentional. You know, it's an intentional thing. Maybe we'll talk a bit more like th about this when we talk about family, actually. So, uh, and, but the last of these is relate, brings us neatly into family and community. 
because I think the Sabbath is such an important part of building families and communities. Um, Exodus 20.10, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of rest dedicated to the Lord your God. On that day, no one in your household may do any work. On the Sabbath day, you must each stay in your place. See, God started the redemption of mankind with a family, Abraham's family. And then he says, remember how I brought you out of Egypt. And they were redeemed to be his people, not just a collection of individuals. We have a problem in that our language has one word for you. And we forget that most of the you's in the Bible are you plural, not you singular. And so we read the Bible a lot through this lens of Western, you know, individualism, you know, consumerism. What can I get? Oh, God's speaking to me. That's great. You do this. You do this. But God is almost always saying, hey, guys, you do this. And so it's always a communal shared experience. So he's building us into a people to represent him. And he says, listen, on, this, on Shabbat, each household stay in your place. Learn to love those closest to you. Sabbath is investment. That's what I would say. Sabbath is investment. God says, take a day each week to invest in the things that are most important. Your relationship with me, your relationship with yourself. You know, it's not indulgent to fill up a car with petrol if you're going on a journey, is it? So you're like the car. Your life is like a car. And he's looking after. So he says, invest in yourself, invest in people closest to you, invest in, relation, in relationship with me. And, and so he says, your first responsibility is not to a mission field or a cause, but the people who are closest to you. Your, the, the revolution of God works from the inside out, doesn't it? Individuals, families, communities, and beyond. That's what happened in the book of Acts. That's what J. John was talking about as well. So we make a decision to work in, on family dynamics. The spiritual starts at home. In, in, in Jewish thinking, there's this idea of the home as the migdash me'at, or little temple, and the Sabbath is a key plank of that. There's a sense of coming back to our key roles, our key relationships. We remember each week, I, I am a husband, I am a father, I am a son or a daughter, you know? Grandfather, yeah. Whatever we are, we remember. Hey, this is this is really um, this is more important. And um, you know, I I I think I remember it, it taught me something as young adult pastors. Now I grew up in a church environment, grew up as a spiritually in, in an environment where there was like so many meetings. There was so much going on in church. Anyone remember? Anyone been through that? Every night there was stuff happening, and people would glory in the, in the, in, in the idea that they would bring their children to church. And, and we, everyone did that, you know, there's children sleeping in church. And, and look, there's some great things about that. I'm, 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 I gained vast amounts from those times. Not that I was that child. I was, grew up in a Jewish family. Mind you, synagogue felt them. But anyway. Um, but, so... But what I found as a young adult pastor is children who had grown up in church, whose parents had been heavily involved in ministry, but yet who were disconnected from their families or disconnected from church because instead of having that sense of rhythm and routine and investment, what they had was a, a resentment towards the church and ministry because they're like, well, you know, Anyway, I'm just, it's not, that's not judging anyone. It's more just like understanding how to, that we walk in rhythm with God, quality time. And so for, for us as a family, it's like we know that Friday night, however busy the week is, Isaac and Levi know, Friday night, we come together. Saturday day, we're, it's family time. Now, sometimes we will connect with other people. We'll have people over. Sometimes we'll, you know, but always there's this sense of, this is our intention and this is our rhythm. This is our routine. We come back together. We have some time all together. We have a meal together. We sit down. However, for me and Denise, how busy we've been during the week, if I've been out speaking or she's been out doing something or whatever it is, we know it's a routine and a rhythm that God says, hey, this is it. Because like going to the gym, see, the Sabbath is, is like a gym for relationships. It's like a gym for loving yourself. It's like a gym for time spent 
on yourself and with others and in your community. It's building the faith muscle of trust. It's all of these things. And there's a reason that it's a rhythm. For us, there's anticipation, there's preparation. People often say, how do I do the Sabbath? As though there's some secret magic, Jewish magic that they want to do, you know? Oh, let me give you the Jewish spell for the Sabbath, which makes everything more restful. Uh, it's, it's more like just common sense in a way. How do you prepare for a holiday? You get the stuff done that you have to do before the holiday. You know, you buy the stuff that you need for the holiday. You, you try and make it relaxing. Be intentional about it. Practice it. The focus of Jewish spirituality is the home more, more than the synagogue. Synagogue is a gathering place, but my memories growing up really are about Passover in the home. It's about the Sabbath in the home. It's about those kind of things, and synagogue is extra. And I think the church just needs to rediscover that balance. And I th- one of the things that's happened in the pandemic, I think, has forced quite a lot of people into that way of thinking. It's a weekly experience of remembering God's goodness. It's quite interesting as well that you get this, dare I, dare I, oh, oh. now I've put the slide up and I've already said it. Oh, goodness. Here we go. Honor your father and mother, then you will live a, a, full, a long, full life in the land your Lord, Lord God is, your, is giving you. There's a real connection between family and Sabbath. It's a multi-generational thing, particularly in Israel. And um, it's interesting, in the, in the Ten Commandments, you get the Sabbath, and then the next commandment is honor your father and mother. It's the beginning of how you love others. Remember I said it was the pivot. Um, on the working days, we're brought into contact with others by what we're doing. On Sabbath, we are choosing to connect with others and build relationships that will enhance our lives and theirs. There's this question you get asked in Israel, which is, where are you going on the Sabbath? You know? Where are you going on the Shabbat? Because there's this sense of no one should be alone on the Shabbat. Because it's a holiday. So I think that is something we need to incorporate into our thinking as churches. You know, there's a plague of loneliness. And a a disconnect between the older generation and the younger generation and a, a real lack, I feel, of that Mediterranean-style community that says, actually, honour the older people in your lives. Mm-hmm. Me and Denise were looking at these photos. She just did this we- wedding album for her parents, a mm-hmm. uh, wedding anniversary album for their, her parents. And, and it's like photos from their, when they were young. And you see them and they look like movie stars, you know? <laughs> and, of course, you, I just know them as Denise's parents, you know? I love them and I know them well. But, you know, I didn't know them then. But it's, it's something that we've lost a little bit is because we don't have an oral tradition is that understanding of the generations. But Sabbath is very, very important plank in that understanding of generational transmission, in that understanding of culture, uh, cultural transmission, and in that understanding of creating families, strong families, not just isolated families, but family structures. Sabbath is so key in that. And what's one of the things we lose when we lose the Sabbath? And again, it's not something you just do in spirit, you know? It's something that takes practice and practical application. So, uh, yeah, last thing, more quickly. I just want to close and then we'll give well, 15 minutes for... Does that work? Yeah. A few questions? Yeah, okay. Society. I'm not going to go into so much on this. Bear in mind, all of this, right, is me summing up 52 Sabbaths, which is why it was a struggle to put it to, to, I've tried to pack probably too much in here, but there we go. If you want to read it at your leisure, it's free, entirely free, so I'm not selling you anything there. Um, and you just sign up, and there you go, you get one a week. Um, but Jesus said to his critics, I have a question for you. Does the law permit good deeds on the Sabbath or is it a day for doing evil? Is it a day to save life or to destroy it? The Sabbath is always linked in the Bible to tzedakah, this understanding of righteousness and what it is. And we are called to impact our wider society and the Sabbath is a key plank of this. Think for a second about who gets to enjoy the Sabbath. Look at that list. 
This includes you, your sons and daughters, your male and female servants, your livestock, and any foreigners living among you. That is a radical list for a society back then. That nothing like that existed in the ancient world. God says everyone, regardless of social standing, age, gender. The Sabbath is this, equalize it. God says, look, you just the Sabbath is a weekly reminder. You are all made in my image. You're all equal. Whatever roles you may take during the week, on the Sabbath, everyone rests. Everyone gets the same rest. Isn't that a radical thing? Yeah. Um, so the Sabbath connects the personal community and society. And the thing is... Um, Walter Brueggemann says this. He says, those who live the Sabbath differently live the other six days differently. And the Sabbath is intended to create and cultivate in us this heart and this mindset that everyone is equal. That we may have different roles, but nobody is of more value to God than someone else. It's not men who are more valuable than women. It's not um, older people more valuable than children. It's, it's, we, it's and the, the, in terms of, well... There's a lot to say about this, <laughs> but the Sabbath was, in some respects, a form of engagement, a judgment on, and a barometer on how we treat those who are less powerful than us, the people that we could exploit, foreigners mm -hmm. in that culture, but weaker people, people with less power, less voice, they get the same rest. They get the same, they get to experience a day where they are not less than they are equal to. And this is brought forward, uh, for, this is reinforced when 40 years later, right, they're about to enter the, ten, uh, the promised land. Do you know there was, you know, remember Moses recaps everything. And he recaps the Ten Commandments. But do you know there's one change? Do you know what it is? It's the reason given for the Sabbath. He says... The same list. And then he says this. Remember, you were once slaves in Egypt, but the Lord brought you out with his stronger hand and powerful arm. That's why the Lord your God has commanded you to rest on the Sabbath day. So he brings them out of, out of Egypt, and he says, now you need to understand that you're made in my image, your identity. You're coming into a new identity now as my people, so honor the Sabbath. That's why you've got to honor the Sabbath. And then, 40 years later, he says, now you're about to go into the promised land. Now, the reason you need to honor the Sabbath. And they were like, what? But you've already told us the reason. No, no, no. I'm telling you the reason now. Because that's God, you know. He's like, it's both. But he um, says it's, it's because you were slaves. And I brought you out. And you're about to go in and build a kingdom. And I want that kingdom to be coming from a place of understanding my compassion. Yes, you're taking it off these people, and the Bible says that they sacrificed their children, and it says, I'm it, elsewhere says, I'm giving you this land because those people are wicked. But he says, the kingdom you're going to build, the community you're going to build to represent me on the earth needs to be one built on my compassion. And the Sabbath, I want you to remember each week that you were slaves. He goes further. He says, you know what the heart of a slave is. That's what God says. So don't oppress the foreigners. Don't oppress the orphans and the widow. He says, remember my power? I'm with you in the battles. Because I brought you out of Egypt so I can bring you into the promised land. I'm going to be with you in the battles. And I think we need to remember this. The Sabbath is a weekly reminder that we are equipped by God's power for the battles that we face in society. But he also says, and, and we need to be warriors, but with God with God's power, and he says also my compassion. None of us have merited what God gives us. Yeah, he says in Exodus 23, verse 9. Did I put that in here? There we go. There we go. Yeah, there you go. And yeah, we're coming to the end. So the Sabbath calls us to humility. It calls us to come away from our idols. If you want a scripture that's another verse, uh, Ezekiel 20, 18 to 20 is a really powerful one about the Sabbath. And do you know that the gospel, Jesus' announcement of the gospel in Luke, also contains the Sabbath? The acceptable year of the Lord 
is a reference to the Jubilee. And, and so you've got this whole system of Sabbaths. We won't go into it now. But the Sabbath is a weekly reminder of the invitation to partner with God in building his kingdom on the earth. Tikkun Olam. Have you heard of this? The repair of the world. The Sabbath is a weekly reminder to engage with those needs of those around us. Last slide. Isaiah says, if you call the Sabbath a delight. I guess the question is, what do we call the Sabbath? Because what you call something defines it. So um, look, there's lots more I could say, but I think it's, we'll stop there. I, I find with the Sabbath, the more you go into it, the more you find, it's, wow, it's really amazing. But what I would say is, they really get political about this, but people get very strident in their sense of like, you know, um, individual liberties and not, you know, no mandated kind of like giving to the poor and no, you know, it's like it all has to come out of our hearts. I'm like, well, yes, but if you actually read the Bible, God's like pretty direct about like the, the, the whole system of the Sabbath is actually a system of God's imposed justice on our community. Debts will be forgiven. God doesn't say, well, see how you feel. Yes, all I'm suggesting is that we need to find God's blueprint for society. Social justice is getting it real. But you know what's happened is that the church has abdicated its responsibility and, what, and all this other stuff is coming in. But we need to reclaim it and the Sabbath is a big part of that. Yeah. Amen. So, uh, would, would there, has anybody, any thoughts, questions before we, I'd like to maybe close in prayer. Yes, hey. Yeah. Um, I haven't received my grade yet, <laughs> but joking aside, it it it's definitely had an impact. Yes, yeah. quite a lot of my church have signed up for. I mean, I have I have a fair voice in my church because we're the oh, spiritual yeah. oversight, and I'm preaching re fairly regularly. Uh, and in fact, I'm preaching. I did a message a little while back called, uh, which had was partly about the Sabbath, and it was like finding the rhythms of God, rest, relaxation, relationships. And actually, on the first and the eighth of August, they've asked me to speak again, but to go into more detail about the Sabbath and also about um, one of the other areas. So, so lots of people signing up for the 52 Sabbaths. There's also a bit of a move. There's a book called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry by a guy called John Mark Comer, which has become quite big, and that talks about the Sabbath. Robert Morris actually wrote a great book called Take a Day Off. Um, so, so, but in my church, what I'm finding is, well, here's the thing. Um, Christianity is not about passing information on to people. It's incarnational. Mm -hmm. Jesus doesn't say, go over there. He says, follow me. So, so what I'm finding is that people know that we live in a particular way and if they see our family and they like what they see, then they will, will want to kind of take on board some of that. So they'll ask us, so hey, what do you do on the Sabbath? Mm -hmm. Denise, funny you should say that. Denise, this went la Wednesday just gone, Thursday just gone, spoke at our young adult gathering meeting, about 40, 50 young adults, I don't know how many young adults were there, and they asked her to speak about the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. And she did an interview about the Sabbath. And the young adult pastors have both signed up for the 52 Sabbath and have started really doing the Sabbath. My sort of aim, though, with these people is to stop them from tipping back over into this kind of... Because people... The self is very sneaky. You know, it, it sort of goes... Right, so, you know, it'd be really good to turn off our phones... And then before you know it, you're judging other people for not turning off their phones. And then it's like you're turning it back into all these rules. And that's why I get a bit wary when people say, so tell us how to do the Sabbath. Because it's kind of like, you know, d not working. How do we not work? You know, we well, just don't work. Like, so, so, so the answer is yes, but I'm actually finding that I need to kind of just go, whoa, you know, don't start judging other people for not doing this stuff. Just live it, radiate, you know. 
demonstrate. So that's what I'm, I'm finding. But definitely it has, it's had, <coughs> ah, oh, oh, no, no, it's all good, it's all good. It's only water. It's probably quite, probably quite welcome. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, so that's what I'm finding. But it, it, it wouldn't be doing much if I wasn't li living some yeah. of it. That's what I find. But I think once people get hold of it, particularly people who are wanting to, are like in families and people in relationships, then it seems to help them. People, people it needs to help. I think that's where I come from with all this stuff, is I'm not coming to churches and saying, you need to do this stuff and believe in Israel. You know, God loves Israel, you should love Israel. It's like, how can I help? I'm here to help. And then I bring this stuff, and it helps, and then people go, wow, this Jewish stuff is really good. <laughs> Rather than you give people Jewish stuff, and it's almost like sometimes you can, this Jewish roots teaching, I see that hand. Sometimes this Jewish roots teaching People, it comes across a bit like being a Jewish, a magician bringing a Jewish rabbit out of a hat. Do you know what I mean? And people go, and you go, ta-da, the rabbit is Jewish. And everyone goes, oh, that's amazing. I would never have thought that. And then it's like, it hasn't changed anything. I'm actually, God's really challenged me, bring this stuff to minister to people. Even the Jewish Jesus, I don't actually tend to teach this stuff. I tend to be ministering in churches and use it as a platform. But, so the Sabbath a bit the same. Hey, so, yeah, Dave. What, what about the, the Saturday Sunday business? Oh, yeah. Someone like yourself who comes from yeah. a Jewish background would, would it be expected to keep the traditional Friday night, Saturday night, but then you've got Paul yeah. saying some consider one day more sacred than another. So would you be keeping, would you, yeah. you're keeping the principle if, as a Christian from a non-Jewish background, you could have the Sunday instead of the Saturday? The simple answer to that is that Sunday in Israel is a working day yeah. and that um, if you get an extra day, then great. I don't think it really... Ma I, don't, I absolutely think that keeping the principles is important. So our, our, the pastors of our church, are, the senior pastors, are me and Denise kind of pastor them, like just in their development. You know, we're, we're there for oversight. We're there for them as support. And we've encouraged them to, to make that time for themselves. Because they're just such diligent hard workers and they're brilliant at all the strategic stuff, diligent, passionate, you know, brilliant at what they do. Don't need us to help them with the running the church. Um, and, but we've encouraged them to take that time. Now, they can't do it the day before Sunday because Sunday is, it is a bit busy. So they take Thursday night and Friday, is their, that's their Sabbath. I personally feel that, yeah. Because I think that's what Jesus is talking about, is don't make it a burden, you know. Oh, oh it's got to be Friday night to Saturday, um, and then you get stressed out because you're preaching on Sunday morning, and oh, no, I you know, wish I'd have done some... But, uh, so so that would be my thinking. But actually, that thing about Paul on, and the days and all that stuff, it's really interesting, the different interpretations of what he's actually talking about, because it, it may not be what it sounds like. Yes. Encouraged people to find a Sabbath. But I find it quite powerful when you talk about the rhythm. Mm -hmm. I think whatever it is, it needs to be a rhythm rather than, I think that helps the principle exactly. So Jamie and Vicky don't each week go, well, what should we have a day for? It's like, no, no, because I think it's a decision made in advance that l helps you to trust and build that routine and rhythm. Yeah, I do think that. Yeah. Just a comment. I mean, you brought it out really. It's about relationship, relationship, our relationship Agreed. with God, relationship with family. Agreed. I teach nine to eleven-year-olds. Yes. And one of the things I have to go in and teach regularly as a as a visitor is Shabbat. They love the Jewish feast because that's what they get food. Every yes, day. absolutely. <laughs> one of the, the straight away when we start talking about what their if you like we take Sunday, what's their Sunday like? Yes. And then when we talk about Shabbat, it's all about Yes. Time with family. Yes. Family meal, not to have their, their um, parents working at that yep. time. Um, and the other thing, I made the mistake mm. one year of putting some of the rules and regulations mm. in. And that just, oh, we don't want to do it now. Mm. But yeah. when you got rid of the rules and regulations and it was about spending time with your family and your family talking to you and having a meal, mm. so 
they were right on board. That's what they wanted. So that's the key word, isn't it? It is. Relationship is absolutely, absolutely, for me, I see that hand. Relationship is absolutely at the heart of it. And I think that, to me, that's what Jesus is saying as well. Yeah, yeah ab absolutely. It's actually an observation. I, I live in New York County, and just last Saturday I drove down to Goldwood Green. Oh. Drove yeah. around Rucks Second Chapel, just got there hot and sweaty. Parked my car in Temple Court in Lewis Bridge Lane Chapel. Just climbed down and just watched the Jewish folk. Mm. And this sense of Sabbath peace just came over me. Mm. They were walking slowly, in families. Yes. Sabbath there. As you watch along the road, you can hear them talking. I'll see that they were They're obviously not walking very far, go nip to the neighbour's house, hand in water and house, walking slowly, far. Everybody knew everybody. Yeah. Real, just we haven't got any idea in this church, church life is what it really is. And Agreed. So it was a real just that touched my heart, that sense of Sabbath peace. What yes. Jewish people know about. Totally. Yeah. It's, and it's funny because we see that now, but what you're also looking at would be a different version of the early church. Yeah. You know what I mean? But we don't have that. We go, it's the Jewish thing now. But that's what the early church, when they talk about meeting house to house. And yeah. I mean, and funnily enough, I was up at Temple Fortune because that's where my cousin lives and all my family are North London Jews. I grew up in Camden. So, so, so that whole area is my uh, stomping ground, really. A massive shift to turn around, isn't it? The For us, I think I so. The, the church's history with Sabbath and cut, uh, changing it from Saturday to Sunday and the whole... Yes. Uh, how do you change that? Well, it's going to take a long more. I, I found, you know what I found with all of this stuff? This is what I, I, I tend to find, is when I was writing the book, for instance, I took out loads of stuff that was anti certain things. You know what I mean? Yeah. Stuff that kind of says, well, Easter's named after Ishtar. and da -da 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 -da. Yeah. I took all that out because I was like, you know what? People get easily kind of condemned and easily discouraged. And, and also, how, how am I going to help them? I'd be better off, and I'm saying this in terms of the Sunday, Saturday thing, right? Yeah. Rather than getting into too much, you should do this, you shouldn't do this. I'm like, present people with a positive vision, grow green grass, as my pa the old pastor used to say, and people will come, you know, to feed. So I'm almost like, with the Saturday, Sunday thing, I often don't, I'm like, well, I don't know, I don't really think about it that much, like, because it's not really the point for me. You know what I mean? But, but, but um, so what I think is really important is exactly that what you're saying. You know, you see that vision of peace yeah. and that vision of what it could be. We need a positive vision of what the Sabbath can be that makes us, and then to live it out that then makes people go, wow, I'm jealous of what you've got there. Yeah. You know, that makes you go, how do you do that? How do you guys have such a, you know, they come around and they go, wow, that's, you know, there's a real peace in your house. And, Part of that is is that so. And it makes you sad that our society is so fragmented now, isn't it? Yeah. You just can't get to that situation. Yeah, it is, but and it, it, but you're right, Charles. It, it, turning the ship around is is. Because it's a 20, 24 seven society we live in. It's, People it's, just don't know how to stop. They don't know how to stop, and 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 even even as Christians, they they've still got that suspicion about old. Yeah. So they don't. They, it, anyway, sorry. What are you going to say? Yes. We were always trying to have a Shabbat meal every Friday. Yes. The greater or lesser extent. Yes. And often invite people. Yeah. Because of the food. Yes. And, you know, people are curious about it. It's true. And, you know, hopefully in time, some of them will also say, come on. So it's not going to be a preacher in the pulpit. No. Well. <laughs> uh, no. Um, <laughs> can I last just say, um, I did, because I didn't say, and I didn't put it on the slide, because that's how organised I am. But um, if you want to sign up to receive the emails, like I say, it's free, so just go to sabbath.love. All you need to do is sabbath.love, put your email, you only need first name and an email address, and that's it. Just, just put it in, and you'll just get a Sabbath reflection once a week, and you won't get loads of spam, or any spam. In fact, you'll get too little 
other stuff I've discovered because people are asking me, well, are you doing, you know, and, but I, I haven't got around to sort of sending out other stuff, but. I think I'm actually, I'm really looking forward to doing this. Um, well, thanks. I it's been a real blessing going this Thank you. Oh, thank you. I ha it's nice I've got some families doing it. Um, Clive and Jane Urquhart, they've been doing, they've been doing it. Uh, they're really good friends, but they've been very encouraging in, in the book and the, the, and they're like, we love it. We get our friends around, we do it, and they're going through it again, which is good. If the book, on the other hand, uh, which is not free, um, but uh, there's, I've got three copies here, but they've put copies in the bookshop, and um, that's a very, this is a very good tool for Jewish people. I didn't realise it was going to be. I kind of writ it, wrote it, writ it, wrote it. I'm a writer, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I wrote it um, with, yeah. But I found that it's also good for Jewish people, better than most. And um, it's a good foundational book for people. You know those people who you're, you're like, I wish they would understand this stuff. Probably a good book for those people. <laughs>